And the Oscar goes to... This image should be held as a historical artifact by all cinephiles for a few reasons. One of them involves this guy, my favorite director of all time winning Best Director, but that's for a later video. The main reason this image belongs in a museum is John Singleton. At 24 years old, not only was Singleton the youngest Best Director nominee in history, but he was also the first ever black director to receive a nomination. This is one of those bittersweet fun facts where you want to celebrate him being the first, but you also hate that it took 64 years for the Oscars to recognize a black filmmaker. Spike Lee was right there with Do the Right Thing two years ago. I paid a lot of money for that jacket, by the way. There was also Gordon Parks, who helped invent an entire genre with Shaft in 1971. But Hollywood's diversity problem is hardly news. Well, I'm here the Academy Awards, uh, otherwise known as the uh, White People's Choice Awards. This is why Singleton is so important. His nomination, I think, helped show artists from marginalized backgrounds that the Oscars did not have to remain the White People's Choice Awards. As Lee Daniels put it, a nomination like Singleton's it inspires not just African American filmmakers, but gay filmmakers, mm -hmm. uh, Puerto Rican filmmakers, Filmmakers that don't have a voice, that feel that they're not in a club, it inspires them. Today we are going to highlight some of the directorial choices that landed Singleton that hugely inspirational Best Director nomination. Today, we're talking about boys in the But before diving in, we here at Film Switch are striving to support the Black Lives Matter movement in whatever way we can. So along with spotlighting excellent filmmaking moments from Black directors, we'll also be donating whatever money we make from this video to the cause. Links are in the description to petitions and organizations so that you can get involved as well. Also, I'm in no position to talk about the black experience. That's what the movie is for. Uh, this video will be focusing on the filmmaking itself. So let's start with a quote about filmmaking. In his book, Making Movies, legendary director Sidney Lumet, he goes on this rant against critics who discuss style as something that's separate from story. Form follows function, writes Lumet. Style is beautiful when it has an organic connection to the material, and that connection is what separates true stylists from decorators. I'd argue 2019's Lion King was made by decorators. Instead of forwarding the original story or complicating its themes, the movie merely regurgitates. It does so spectacularly through photorealistic technology, and maybe displaying spectacle is all a movie has to do. Its money certainly proves that movies can be enjoyed without marrying function and form, but I prefer a wedding, and I think John Singleton did too. That means before we look at his stylistic choices, we have to understand what Boys in the Hood is about, because what it's about influence all the choices that Singleton made, and who better to to articulate what Boys in the Hood is about than Singleton himself. I did the film actually to show how the difference between what a responsible, you know, open-minded black man would do in raising his son, and so I could contrast that to, to the way, you know, his son's two friends would be raised just by their mother. So essentially, Boys in the Hood is about parenting, and I think few scenes better represent that major theme than Furious Styles educating his son his son's friend, his community, and us, the audience, on the malicious machine that is gentrification. It's called gentrification. It's what happens when the property value of a certain area is brought down. Gentrification isn't the hardest, but it also isn't the easiest concept to grasp, and it's not uncommon for filmmakers to, to halt a story's narrative progression in order to make sure that the audience is caught up on the information. The Big Short, for example, uses celebrity cameos to keep an audience engaged whenever something like a CDO has to be explained. So here's how a synthetic CDO works. The point of The Big Short, when I see it, I think it's, it's less to tell a story and more to creatively inform people on what led to the Great Recession. That means the fourth wall breaking cameos are a sensible stylistic choice, but for boys in the hood, not so much. Instead of sticking to shots like these, a furious talking and people listening. Why is it that there's a gun shop on almost every corner in this community? Why? Tell you why. For the same reason that there's a liquor store on almost every corner in the black community. Why? They want us to kill ourselves. Singleton could have cut to, to the liquor stores, the gun shops, all the visual elements of Furious's speech in order to better guarantee that the audience understood the effects of gentrification. But the purpose of the scene in the movie as a whole, as we heard, it's not about getting people to understand gentrification in the same way that the big short is about getting people to understand the recession. As Singleton said, the overarching theme of Boys in the Hood is parenting, so we made sure to keep the billboard scene related to parenting by having the parent 
and the young adults that parent is trying to raise on screen at all times. It's not as flashy as cutting to some sort of dramatization of Furious' speech, but a flashy, big short-ass style of filmmaking where the camera is always moving and cuts are always happening is not what Boys in the Hood needed from its director. Singleton showed stylistic restraint by keeping the billboard scene simple, and that restraint, I think, is evidence of his commitment to letting story dictate the style. And that's only talking about what Singleton didn't do by resisting the temptation that I'm sure a lot of directors feel, especially first-time directors. Like, this was his debut film by resisting that that need to sort of show off all your your, your tricks that you learned in film school he went to USC by resisting that temptation Singleton was able to focus on the little things that help deepen the parenting theme and also tell us where we are in the story Ricky drinking milk for example cues us into his role in the scene and the film as a whole it is a visual reminder that he is as young and inexperienced in certain things as the frustrated teens in Rebel Without a Cause the little boy grappling with his parents divorcing Kramer vs. Kramer us trying to run this channel cheers the milk tells us Ricky and Trey are kids and therefore impressionable. They may be learning about the need for solidarity amongst black people from Furious. I was walking around motherfucking Compton and all, man. Rick, it's the 90s. Can't afford to be afraid of our own people anymore, man. They may have heard Furious, but, but the presence of milk, that symbol of their adolescence, reminds us that these lessons can be easily forgotten. And they almost are when Trey picks up a gun and nearly becomes part of the statistic that Singleton, and I think by proxy Furious, was worried about. The statistic being... One out of 17 black American males will be murdered each year and most of them at the hands of another black male. Again, while Furious' plea for solidarity amongst black people is heard loud and clear. And what we need to do is we need to keep everything in our neighborhood, everything black. Black owned with black money. While that plea is there, and while Trey and Ricky and even Doughboy praise Furious' message. Yeah, Pops was talking, speaking, man, speaking the truth and shit. Yeah, Pops is like motherfucking Malcolm Farrakhan. <laughs> the praise is there. But the presence of milk tells us it is vulnerable to the untested and reactionary minds of the young adult hearing that plea. Oh, oh, you bad now. You bad. You gotta shoot somebody now. Including milk is a stylistic choice directly linked to the story being told, and so is the way that the scene is staged. Here we see the group start to gather around Furious. Notice the the choice to keep Furious on the elevated part of the ground. He is the one with the higher knowledge, so it makes sense to put him slightly above the people hearing him. It makes sense to give him his own shot as the scene progresses, but it's important to remember that his goal is not to present himself as some sort of unreachable ideal. He is relaying the knowledge he has back to his people because he wants them to be up there with him. He wants them to carry the same knowledge that he has, and that want dictates the way that the scene is shot. To stay true to Furious's character, the character he wrote, Singleton had to make sure that he was shot in such a way where he was only slightly elevated above the rest in the same way that Jesus is often only slightly elevated in depictions of the Sermon on the Mount. Am I comparing Furious Styles to Jesus? Hell yeah. Learn way more from him than the other guy. Like, never respect someone who doesn't respect you back. Never gonna forget that. Yeah. Yeah, you got it. Anyways, Singleton made sure that Furious was only slightly elevated, and he also made sure this shot of an isolated Furious did not remain permanent. People in the community are worked back into Furious's shot, and Furious is worked into their shots because that is what Furious wants. Like a good parent and a good leader, Furious wants his, his higher knowledge to become common knowledge. He wants his lessons to be practical. You have to think, young brother, about your future, huh? We've seen that Singleton's staging and, and his use of milk is designed to help express each character's inexpressible sentiments. And if that's not masterful filmmaking, then I don't know what is. I also love how the background of everyone's individual shots represents their mental state. Ricky and Trey are placed in front of the most suburban looking houses in South Central LA because they have the most interest in getting out of the area and maybe the best chance. Ricky with his football scholarship and Trey with his grades. This group seems to be a stand-in for Doughboy, who has sort of submitted to the violent mentality that results in black on black crime and threaten solidarity. Fool roll up, try to smoke me. I'm gonna shoot the motherfucker if he don't kill me first. You're doing exactly what they want you to do. One could say Doughboy and the Compton residents are lost in the metaphorical woods that is that violent mentality. Woods that Furious is trying to pull them out of through education. So behind the group, you see, of course, a bunch of green. The liquor also helps solidify that the group probably has a clouded, lost in the woods mental state. And as for Furious himself, you see his head positioned right in front of the billboard that sparked the gentrification discussion. And the positioning makes it seem like the info is just pouring out of his brain. Notice too how realty has been mostly shortened to real. 
which highlights that he is speaking the truth. Also, this might just be me, but I feel like I'm looking up at him a bit more than the others who seem to be framed at eye level with the audience, which only adds to the elevated teacher parent position we discussed earlier. Everything about that scene, from the content to the aesthetic, is tied directly to the narrative at large. Far from being a decorator, Singleton was a director, a great director who married function and form, and in doing so, was able to guarantee his film, his debut film, Boys in the Hood, a spot in the canon of movies that we're going to be talking about until the end of time. His nomination was beyond well-earned and maybe even deserved the win. May he rest in peace. Thanks for watching.